Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Olney. I'm the Liberal Democrat MP for Richmond Park and also the Liberal Democrat spokesperson on business. Uh, we're here today for our seminar on uh, post COP26 priorities for sustainable finance organized by the all party parliamentary group for sustainable finance. Uh, I can see the numbers of participants just ticking up. So I'm just going to uh, wait perhaps a couple more minutes to let people in. Uh, but while I do, this is just to let you all know that this session is going to be recorded um, uh, and obviously made available afterwards, uh, but just obviously important that you know that. Um, we have um, a fantastic panel here today who are going to give us their thoughts on uh, sustainable finance post COP26 uh, priorities for now and, and the next few years. Uh, so just while we're all, uh, while people are still logging on, I will just do some quick introductions of who we have on the panel. Um, our first speaker is Ryan Jude. Now Ryan is, uh, comes from the Green Finance Institute and he's the program director for green ta taxonomy work uh, uh, with a focus on advising the UK government on implementing a UK taxonomy through the Green Technical Advisory Group. Uh, Ryan also works with the Institute's sector focused coalitions and initiatives, brings together key stakeholders across the public and private sectors, academia, civil society, in order to unlock barriers to the deployment of capital to deliver tangible economic outcomes. So uh, Ryan will be speaking first, and then he's going to be followed by Heather McKay, who we've got with us here. Heather is a policy advisor in the sustainable finance team at E3G, advising a range of government, civil society, and non-state actors on the intersection between the climate crisis and finance. Uh, she was responsible for UK finance outcomes towards COP26 and worked closely with the international finance team. And our third panelist is Julia Jasinska, who's a senior policy advisor for sustainable finance in the financial services team at the CBI. And as part of this, she led the CBI's engagement on sustainable finance policy in the UK and internationally, and was part of the CBI's COP26 representation. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of our uh, panelists uh, and uh, hearing uh, their, their contributions. I'm gonna ask all of them to speak for about five to 10 minutes, and then we will use the rest of the hour for Q&A and a discussion. So just to set the scene, uh, COP26, as I'm sure everybody knows, was held in Glasgow uh, at the beginning of this month, uh, attended by 193 countries, and they all agreed on a number of outcomes for climate finance. The final text committed developed countries to double the collective share of adaptation finance within a 100 billion annual target for 2021 to 2025, and to reach the 100 billion goal uh, $100 billion goal as soon as possible. Uh, and they committed to a process to agree on long-term climate finance beyond 2025. So there's lots to talk about there. Um, there's a lot to, uh, to discuss, both in terms of uh, how the climate challenge is going to be financed, who's going to be financing it, uh, and what, what we need to be doing now and over the next few years uh, to, to reach that $100 billion goal. So I'm going to ask Ryan Jude to, uh, to be the first of our panelists. Um, and thank you very much, Ryan, take it away. Great, thanks, Sarah, thanks for the introduction. So as Sarah said, I'm Ryan, I work at the Green Finance Institute. I'm gonna just run through some of the key things that were raised at COP and then Heather and Julia will, I'm sure, go into a lot more detail on a lot of them, particularly around transition plans, which I know they're both heavily invested in. So high level, I think overall, this was a positive COP for finance, despite some of the high profile issues that were flagged in the media. And I say this because progress was made. And for the first time at COP, we saw private finance really taking a central role. And this could only be a positive as we need both public and private finance to achieve our transition to net zero. We've seen it referred to as a finance focused COP. And to be honest, it really was. Lots of pavilion stands were run, ran by funds or banks. Speakers were keen to highlight the need to mobilize private finance. And while some of the policy initiatives may have faltered, as we saw in some of the water down of the text on the final day, there was definitely progress made in the finance space. On the flip side, however, there was also an increased scrutiny and discussion on greenwash and the need to address it. The days where general pledges are just accepted at face value, face value from financial institutions is gone, and granular detail is definitely what we need now. So take a step back, I'm going to quickly run through some of the key areas that were raised. So first, though, a little bit on terminology. 
The real progress made at this COP was that finance previously would often be used to only refer to climate finance. Climate finance being the public funding transfers between developed nations and developing nations, that famous $100 billion per annum figure that you would have heard an awful lot about. And the failure to meet that $100 billion figure was one of the big disappointments of COP. It's likely to be hit in 2023. At that point, the figure will hopefully be much higher. Let's, let's wait and see what happens. But to take a step back from that, it's important that it wasn't just the climate finance being talked about at the conference this time round. Which brings me to sort of pledges from the full financial sector and GFAVs, or the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. It made a $130 trillion pledge to align financial flows to net zero. And this was great to see. It means that around 40% of global financial assets are now aligned with climate goals. This includes 95 banks with $66 trillion in assets under management that are committed to aligning their lending and investment portfolios with net zero emissions by 2050. And this is a huge achievement, but also brings in my previous comment on avoiding greenwashing. The devil here will be in the details, and details are much needed. But it's a huge positive nonetheless. Getting these big pledges over the line at these large financial institutions cannot be underestimated as to how, how difficult that can be. And also, don't underestimate the impact of peer pressure. It's 40% currently, but that will grow over the coming years. People are often looking at what their fellow competitors are doing. So one of the key trends going forward will be looking to see the details of how this wall of $130 trillion of capital will be channeled towards net zero and also seeing who else is going to join these commitments. Another couple of things announced on Finance Day, which will form key priorities for sustainable finance going forward. The Chancellor, of course, announced that the UK will become the first net zero aligned financial services centre and the requirement for transition plans. As I said, I know Heather and Julia are very heavily invested in this space. So I'll let them talk about it more. But some of our work at the GFI and my work on the green taxonomy will be feeding into this. The green taxonomy being a dictionary, essentially, to define what a sustainable economic activity is. And we'll be interested to see over the next couple of years how that can support transition plans. A key trend of this also will be not just the development of transition plans, but hopefully an uptick in the amount of transition bonds and sustainability linked loans that will be issued. Again, we'll, we can talk about that a bit more further on in the discussion. Also, the SCA announced its new disclosure and regulation advisory group. This is another thing that's incredibly important because it will be looking to develop sustainable labels for products that fall to retail investors. This is again important around getting around the greenwashing issue and ensuring that there is transparency in a lot of the commitments being reported. So what next? I've touched on some of these things as we've gone through. Um, I think one of the key things will be just watch closely as to what banks are doing. Client engagement is going to be crucial, developing these transition plans, adding further clarity and further impetus for banks and their largest clients. We want to see social inclusion and fairness being further embedded in finance plans. And that's something that's going to be absolutely crucial going forward. We all know that those in developing nations and those who are less well off will be, will be the worst impacted by climate change. And it falls on developed nations and the finance players to help support that, to help support their, their transition. And then the key thing for us is going to be scrutiny of these plans, hopefully rolling updates, further transparency and granular details through tools such as the taxonomy, but also many other areas as well. And I will leave it there, Sarah. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was really, really interesting. Um, and I think a great way to open our session. Uh, I'm now going to ask Heather McKay from E3G if she would like to, uh, to give us her thoughts. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, of course. And um, I'll just say that you all have the delight of having someone speak about COP26, who's also from Glasgow. So um, it was a really personal COP. So as Sarah mentioned, um, I lead on our UK portfolio of sustainable finance work at E3G. So E3G has historically had a deep specialism in sustainable finance, both public and private financial reform. And we've worked really, really closely with the UK government over the past few years on a number of the pieces that Ryan and Julie and I are going to mention this morning. So the reason we have this focus is because, it, as I'm sure we all agree, we see finance, both the delivery on the ground and the policy design, as the essential bridge between pledges on net zero and action. This coincidentally, as Ryan said, was a major theme that emerged from COP26, with financial delivery and credibility the dominant narratives. 
This is particularly interesting for us in the UK because these are areas where the UK has a real chance to succeed domestically and lead internationally, creating sustainable growth and opportunities in our own country and encouraging replication from other countries worldwide to get us globally to net zero. To this end, I'm gonna go through a couple of the policies in slightly more detail. Ryan has given a brilliant overview. Um, but I think the first one that I draw your attention to, and it didn't get a huge amount of profile, even though it really should have, because it's momentous, is the Chancellor's announcement of a net zero financial centre. This was preceded in the Greening Finance Roadmap and the net zero strategy that came out um, in October um, of the announcement of a net zero financial system. So I, I do apologize. I know there's been a lot of policy documents that have come out in the last month, so no worries. I think we're all feeling tired and confused. But I'll give you a quick overview of the difference. So a net zero financial system um, is a plan, basically, that integrates the public policy and regulatory tools that the government has at its disposal, together with the private market signals and regulations that inform the decisions of market actors. So basically, one slots into the other. The creation of a net zero financial centre aimed at private finance and greening that, should slot within a broader vision for greening the way that the UK thinks about delivering finance, both public and private, for and climate change. It's actually kind of shocking that we didn't have a plan before, because how are we meant to get to net zero? How are we meant to deliver on the promises of our, of, um, that the government's made on climate change, unless we think about how we're going to finance it? Investors and businesses and consumers need policy certainty and really clear signals if they're going to change their investments, if they're going to decarbonize their business models, then that's pretty um, self-evidential. So if we don't have a plan as a government, we're not going to get this rapid and um, uh, at scale decarbonization we need, and we're not going to be able to unlock private finance at the scale we need to deliver the, the deep and cross-sectoral decarbonization that the Net Zero Strategy is made out. Why public and private? Why can't it just be private? So um, as Ryan mentioned, we've seen a fantastic um, appetite demonstrated um, at COP26 by private finance for net zero investment opportunities. And that is very welcome. I think it's 130 trillion, um, if I believe, um, that was announced at COP26. However, private finance alone isn't gonna deliver net zero. But even though we have this commitment, a lot of those funds aren't actually flowing towards the new markets that we need to get us to net zero. And that's because public finance and public policy has a really well-proven role in unlocking new markets, de-risking new investment opportunities, and supporting private finance and business in just edging along on the right path to get us to net zero. So it's really important that we don't silo these conversations. And that's why the government needs a coherent strategy. So what you should look out for is a green finance strategy review that's happening in the summer in 2022. And again, one of the key things that E2G will be working on this year, hopefully together with CBI and GFI as well, um, will be this integration of public and private finance together. Um, it's a holistic conversation that we need. Some pieces that slot in here that I think are really crucial to mention. Um, firstly, as Ryan brought up, transition plans. So I think before last year, no one had heard of a transition plan. I think it was a completely new topic. Um, I know with the, the um, tremendous efforts of a number of people, including E3G, a number of organizations and CBI, we brought this to the forefront. We've moved to the year from where disclosure of climate risk was the frontier to requiring a plan for action as being the frontier of the year, which is showing you how quickly the conversation is moving. So as, as per the Chancellor's speech, these will be requirements on all large listed companies in the UK and financial institutions. Um, it's a requirement to disclose a plan for how they're gonna meet their net zero commitments. And I mean, and that's a, a brilliant step in itself. But plans are only as good as their design and delivery. And what I'm sure Julia will talk about this, but what stopped a lot of companies in the last year, last few years making net zero commitments is they just don't, they don't quite know how to do it. So, and there's also a million different methodologies out there as well. Um, so what's brilliant is we now see that this, um, the government has also announced a task force, the transition plans task force, which E2G is gonna be the co-secretariat of, which is gonna to aim to provide that kind of standardized guidance for what good looks like for a transition plan, which hopefully is going to help companies and help investors actually start to take those steps towards decarbonisation. A key thing for those in the audience is making sure that this guidance actually is science-based. We can't allow the watering down of guidance. It has to be one point five aligned. Um, and I think the devastation we've seen worldwide, including the fact that all the places I want to go on holiday are on fire, really evidences the fact that that needs to happen. 
Um, this work's going to happen over 2022. Um, so again, do reach out to E3G if you want to find out more detail. Um, we're shaping up plans at the moment for this task force, but again, it's about this guidance being science-based. Um, Ryan uh, has mentioned the taxonomy, so I won't go into too much more detail. One thing I will use, I'll mention on that is, again, the taxonomy is this dictionary for what is green and what isn't. The market needs certainty, so it's great that we're going to have a centralised dictionary. But why just apply it to private finance decision making? This should be applied as part of a net zero financial system to both public and private decision making. So we understand across the board, you know, where we're going right, where we're going wrong on climate investment and where the gaps are. And also we have that clarity to transform as well. The last piece I'm going to mention before I close off, I think I've run a bit over time, um, and I, it's something I'm really passionate about actually, is the UK Infrastructure Bank. This is huge, and I'm really congratulations to the government for announcing it. This is the linchpin in the government strategy of meeting net zero, and it's a key vent, uh, vehicle for delivering finance for the transition. The bank has a dual mandate, levelling up and net zero. However, uh, I think there's increasing recognition of the synergies between creating jobs and creating growth and creating a climate safe world and sustainable world. And I think that's something we'd like to see an evolving conversation happen about within government. Moreover, as Ryan quite rightly mentioned, institutions like this are only as successful and only as strong as the trust that they build. And so the bank should really think about and really be working with the communities across the UK that need jobs and sustainable growth and the investors and businesses that need support to really make sure it's a long lasting and future fit institution. So what people in the audience should be looking out for with that, um, we're expecting the strategic plan from the bank to come out in summer 2022. Um, we're also hoping that the bank will be set up in legislation um, on a similar time frame, but that's, that's to be decided. Um, so a couple of aspects that I just come out for, I'd like for is one, the bank being set up for the long term. That's really crucial if it's gonna provide the certainty that businesses and investors need to do what they need to do. Secondly, to, I think it's um, increasingly being proven, sustainable growth is net zero growth. And so we want to see the bank have a net zero investment. It can't just invest in stuff to create jobs that actively harms the environment. And thirdly, I think the bank, the bank really needs to be additional. So the bank needs to firstly invest in all the tricky sectors that the private sector can't do at the moment. That's the purpose of this institution, is to create new markets. Um, and the previous iteration had a lot of success for that, for that with the wind industry in the UK, which is now a thriving industry. And it also needs to be that knowledge hub and the capacity building hub for local authorities who are in desperate need of support, and also for investors as well, who don't quite know how to build these new and risky products up off the ground. So that kind of project development and technical assistance function will be really crucial to make sure the bank has is set up and ready to go. So in summary, um, the net zero financial system is huge. You should be shouting about it to everyone you know, and I'm happy to talk about it later. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Heather. I found that really interesting. And I think one of your opening statements there has been a really clarifying message for me that finance is the essential bridge between pledges and action. And I think, as I say, I, I find that that, you know, really kind of sums it up in, in a, a, about as about as well as I've heard it summed up and also what you were saying there about the importance of action being science-based and I think that backs up what Ryan was saying about the dangers of greenwashing we all have to be clear uh, you know and, and and have that science to, to back us up on exactly what action we need to be uh, taking and what actions we need to expect our all of our big organizations to be taking as well and that the science is really important to push back on the greenwashing so um last but by no means least uh, I'd like to bring in Julia Jasinska from the CBI uh, to give her response uh, or her opening remarks as well thank you very much Julia Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, as you mentioned, I lead on the CBI's work on sustainable finance, and um, I'm pleased to say that it's one of the key areas of interest for our members um, uh, across the whole economy, and, and rightly so. Um, we all know that we need trillions of dollars to close the financing gap um, to get to a net zero and a more sustainable economy. Um, and um, only businesses in collaboration with the government can provide that scope of innovation and investment to actually achieve those net zero targets and, and other social and environmental, environmental uh, targets. And um, at COP26, the CBI organized a business dinner and one of our guests was the US climate envoy, um, John Kerry. And uh, he said something that I think we've all felt when we've been there. 
And that's, um, it was a special COP because businesses have truly been at the center of it. And um, I think there was a different sense of urgency, a different scale of announcements. We've heard about 130 trillion of private finance going to net zero projects. Um, and, and the CBI works with businesses of all sizes to ensure that, that you know, business remains at the center of this discussion from large companies to SMEs. Um, so our goal is to ensure that finance enables the transition to a greener and fairer economy. And, and this is why in the months leading up to COP26, we gathered our members to write the CBI's position paper on sustainable finance. Um, it's called Financing the Transition to a Sustainable Future. I will uh, drop it in a chat later. And we published it in October. And um, perhaps it's, it, it's useful if I uh, tell a bit more about this. So um, in the paper, we say that a sustainable future has to consist of three pillars, uh, sustainable economy, sustainable markets, and sustainable communities. All of these things interact together. And we provide three principles on the, what the government should focus on to support businesses in paying for a greener and fairer future. Um, so the first thing is, uh, I'm going to echo what um, Heather has already said, we need effective sectoral plans and mechanisms that can unlock sustainable finance flows. So this is particularly relevant for ensuring that we have the sustainable economy because the key in, in, in to a sustainable future lies in ensuring that there are enough sustainable projects to invest in across different sectors and across different regions. Finance is not, not the end all and um, beyond an end all. We, we need something to invest in. So solid government plans in sectors such as transport and buildings are key to enhance this investor confidence. And then the second piece of the puzzle is um, we need to de-risk private investments and enhance public-private collaboration to unlock uh, private capital flows. And, and this is particularly relevant in the case of less established sectors and technologies where, where you know, there's less investor confidence. Then our second principle is the need to ensure appropriate policy frameworks and unambiguous regulation to allow financial services sector to drive the growth of sustainable finance. So, it will be impossible to transitional transition sustainable economy without sustainable markets. This is how these two connect. And um, the financial services sector needs government action and regulatory tools to be able to appropriately estimate sustainability related risks and opportunities. Um, the key to this is obviously we need clear, consistent and usable sustainability disclosures and metrics, taxonomy included. The CBI works with, uh, with the GFI and E3G on that project. Um, and what, what we say here is that um, these metrics and disclosures should focus primarily on outcomes such as lower carbon emissions and improved biodiversity to make sure that we have that real economy link. Um, and finally, our final principle um, that, that all of our members are really passionate about is international convergence in sustainability standards. Um, so at the moment, uh, international businesses face a plethora of different standards and regulatory requirements. Uh, across different jurisdictions and this the reason why it matters is because it makes sustainable investing at a global scale quite difficult um, it's hard to measure where this money is going what's its impact and this is why um, this is why if we're serious about solving the climate crisis at a global level it's a global crisis we need to make sure that there is that international collaboration and we've seen a lot of progress at COP26 um, with that, we had an announcement that there's going to be IFRS Foundation is going to work on an international sustainability standards board, which is going to work on an international standards. But um, what, what we need to do as um, businesses and, and, and NGOs is to ensure that this works in practice and that it, this is actually um, this is actually um, promoted by different jurisdictions, because if, it's, if they don't you know, put it into their regulatory systems, it's not going to take us far. Um, so I think I wanted to follow up on one thing that um, Ryan said, um, the importance of ensuring uh, sustainability across the board. Um, the, the last pillar of, of action that the CBI identifies in our paper is sustainable communities. And our members agree that we need to broaden um, the focus beyond green finance aimed at primarily um, climate related and environmental risks to broader sustainable, sustainability concerns to sustainable finance. Um, so plans to decarbonize the UK economy need to go together with plans for just transition and leveling up of disadvantaged regions. And the perfect example of how this um, can be done is the UK Green Guild, 
um, a, a relatively new project, uh, which besides focusing on decarbonization, identifies social co-benefits of eligible investments. So this very much shows how sustainability, um, environmental sustainability, climate sustainability, and social sustainability, it's not an either or, it can be an end that, that goes together. Um, so now moving on a bit to what's next and, and, and to look at the progress that we've made. Uh, the, the Treasury and base have done a brilliant job with the recent greening finance roadmap. I think this has given invest, uh, businesses a lot of confidence. We know what's coming with disclosures. We know that, um, that that taxonomy is going to have a certain timeline that's going to be discussed with businesses. And I think now that we have all of these announcements along with the um, along with transition plans that Heather discussed, we need to make sure that we uh, get these foundational policy frameworks right and focus on the real economy impact. So the questions that we should be asking um, is not whether the frameworks we develop are perfect because perfect should not be the enemy of the good. We should focus on ensuring that they aid the transition, reduce carbon emissions and lead to positive uh, biodiversity and social outcomes. Um, so th the same goes for, you know, putting UKIP um, in practice, making sure that um, businesses CFOs, not only sustainability professionals, are engaged in these discussions and, and actually um, know what's coming their way because at the end of the day, they will be the ones deciding where the money is going and they need to understand how to disclose under the investments. Um, we need to make sure that we get this international pillar of sustainable finance regulations right. And maybe just um, the final thing that I would say is that um, it's really key that regardless of what's happening at the, you know, on the regulatory side of things that we ensure whole economy participation in sustainable finance. So for example, um, one of the examples that we always discuss is our SMEs. They are not covered by these regulations uh, usually or, or, or at all in, in most cases. So taxonomy, they're not covered, disclosures, they're not covered. However, uh, they, you know, it's important for them to know how to do this reporting on a voluntary basis because if they don't do that, they might end up being excluded from supply chains of large companies that do face these compulsory requirements. So one of our asks in a paper, and um, I know the APPG on Fair Business Banking has, has done quite a lot of work on this, is to, to ensure that companies such as SMEs and, and uh, private companies as well know how to participate in, in a net zero economy and, and are actually actively doing it. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's everything for me. Uh, for now and uh, happy to discuss further. Thank you very much, Julia. That was all really interesting. And I think one of the things I'm picking up there is again, that sort of international convergence of standards and how important that's going to be in terms of making sure that, um, uh, you know, companies feel confident about investing and particularly in a global, uh, a, a, you know, a, a global investment, because obviously it's a global, a global issue. And so that more than anything is probably the most important thing. Um, so what I want to, so we're going to op, uh, throw open the, to the floor now for questions. I've got a few already in the chat, but if you have got a question you'd like to ask, please put it in the chat and I will, um, and I will read it out. What I'm going to do, because I see three in the chat already, uh, what I'm going to do is, 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 is give you all three at once, because that might be that you've all got sort of different thoughts or different um, areas of expertise, um, and uh, you might want to answer different parts. So the first one um, is, is mostly to Heather from Chidi Oti Obihara. Um, you make an excellent point about the need to develop a net zero financial system and not just a financial centre, but could you talk in a bit more detail about the potential place that a UK or global climate finance, finance plan might have, analogous to the US climate finance plan? So you can hold that thought for a second. Uh, this one is to all three. Do the panel accept oil industry protestations that for an ordered wind down of fossil fuel reliance, further exploration and oil field development is still needed? And if not, what can be done? I think that's a really important, uh, that's getting into the whole, you know, moving away from fossil fuels, but nevertheless, fossil fuels still have, uh, you know, are still, you know, a massive part of our current economy. And what's the best way to, to, to maintain that orderly and just transition? And the final question, um, sorry, the one about uh, fossil fuels was from Jeff Harvey. And then from Hugh Davis, could the panel give thoughts about how best to integrate deforestation into climate disclosure and transition plans, given its importance to 
uh, 1.5 degrees. And obviously what we did see at COP26 was a big announcement on deforestation, which I think is a, a real advance on where we were before. And as Hugh has identified, deforestation does contribute so much to carbon emissions so that uh, a commitment on that is something that's really, really welcome. So can I come to Heather first? As, as I say, that first question was directed specifically to you. So if you can answer that one and then maybe give your thoughts on the other two, and then I'll come to the, uh, the other two panelists. Thank you, Heather. Yes, of course. It's a, it's a great question. I think that um, we're only as strong as how we work together internationally and in meeting climate change because climate change is a global problem. So it's not just enough for one financial centre in the world and one financial system in the world to go net zero. Eventually, they all have to and all financial flows have to be aligned with 1.5. Um, I, I think that there is a huge potential for replication if the UK does this well. So um, an example I'll bring out um, uh, was TCFD, the climate risk disclosure, climate financial risk disclosure and requirement that the UK made mandatory, uh, one of the first countries to do so in November uh, 2020. Um, it then used its position, its diplomatic position over the course of that year to effect similar commitments across the G7 um, of mandatory TCFD. There's a huge amount of potential for the UK to do this for transition plans and more broadly for the net zero financial system idea. And I think it'd be incredibly important to do so. Um, in terms of um, other initiatives that are existing at the moment, you again, um, acronyms, acronyms, acronyms are the death of us all in the climate space. But the B3W, so the Build Back Better World initiative, which launched at COP26, is a plan from the EU, UK and US. It's a huge plan for mobilizing finance towards infrastructure investment. So yes, that is a, a you know, has a somewhat limited lens and somewhat limited focus, even though infrastructure is kind of quite a big um, uh, topic in general, but it, it, it's a demonstration of what can happen if, and the, the huge impact that can happen if large and uh, large jurisdictions work together on climate change. So I think that um, I'd be pleased to see um, the UK using its diplomatic position over the next year with its COP27 presidency towards Egypt, um, really um, you know, encouraging replication of this idea. Though I will emphasize that it's uh, it, international replication is contingent on domestic success. So I think it's really important we do our job first. Um, on the other questions, um, I think that I'll just pick up one about fossil fuels. Uh, look, it's a really, it's a really challenging topic. I know because it's a many pension funds, many large investors already hold a huge amount of assets in, in legacy industries like fossil fuels, and we're not arguing through um, you know, climate action that we want to see a rapid divestment overnight. That's not going to happen. That's not feasible. However, if we are going to meet one point five. Um, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, came up with a report um, a few months ago that stated that we can't have new investment in fossil fuel exploration and extraction. Existing investments have to be transitioned away and new investments have to cease. And I think that's the attitude we should take. And it's part of the reason why transition plans are so essential, because transition plans are about a managed transition away from oil and gas towards green. They're not about dropping all your investments overnight. They're about guiding companies and investors towards net zero. So I think that's really important. Um, on um, deforestation and climate exposure to transition plans, um, I think deforestation is, is incredibly critical given that the Amazon is on the point of desertification, which, um, which all the lovely trees turn into not so nice sand um, to make it a really simple thing. Um, so I think it's incredibly important we integrate that. There has been some leadership from the task force on nature related um, climate disclosures. I think that using their guidance and leveraging their guidance would be useful. I also think that tools such as the one produced by Global Canopy, which is an amazing NGO, which has produced this tool called, tool called Trace, which allows investors and businesses to have clarity over their supply chains and their investment supply chains as to where they hold deforestation risk, can be really useful in informing the conversation and informing quite how we tackle this deforestation question within financial regulation. So I think that's a I'm going to pause there because I know that Julia and Brian are going to have some great points yes. as well. Thank you, Heather. That's a that's a really good uh, a really good overview. Uh, Ryan, can I come to you? Um, any or all parts of those three questions? <laughs> Yeah, I'll jump in first on the oil and gas question. The way the question has been phrased by Jeff, the answer is no. There shouldn't be any further exploration of oil field development. We need to, we need to think about the timeframes here. So if you start exploring for new oil, oil fields now, they'll come online in five to 10 years time, but then have a 30 year asset life, where they're either going to be polluting or they're going to become stranded assets. 
where after 10 years, they're just not going to operate anymore. And that is a bad financial decision. It's just a bad investment. And there are plenty of vested interests that fall into the space that will continue to argue for this. It's our job to make it clear that we shouldn't be having any new oil fields being developed. And they made a really good point though around transition plans. And I think that the divestment movement had its time, it was really important five to 10 years ago to get attention onto moving out of fossil fuels. But now people often forget that if you divest, someone else is buying it, someone else is taking that. And what happens often it moves from public scrutiny into the murky realms of private finance where it's harder to track what's happening. So it's not all about divestment on existing assets, it's about transitioning and having that investor stewardship and that investor conversation with your investee companies to decarbonize them. But um, to Jeff's question, I, I would say no. And I, I feel Heather agrees, I'm sure Julia will as well. Um, on the bit from Hugh on deforestation, obviously one of the big announcements at COP was that 100 world leaders, 100 countries had signed up to end and reverse deforestation by 2030. Again, it's a big pledge. Whether it happens in practice is another thing. I think Indonesia came out the day after saying it was an incredibly unfair arrangement. So whether they're fully on board is a different question. But there are other ways that finance can help influence this. So a couple of things that, that we're doing here, the taxonomy, very high level, has six environmental objectives. And any economic activity has to contribute to one of them, but then do no significant harm to the other five. Through this, we can wind down deforestation because it can be seen as doing harm if deforestation is involved in your supply chain for whatever your ultimate economic activity is. So that's an indirect way through reporting that we can start to reverse deforestation. Um, we talked about the work of the TNFD as well. So the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures. This again is embedding the impact of deforestation and other nature related issues into your plans and into your finances. Um, Sarah, I've seen another question come in specifically for me, if that's all right to build. I think it was a follow up to the first question. So there was a question in the chat around whether there's going to be any gaps between the EU and the UK's taxonomy. I wouldn't call it gaps, but divergence will be expected. And this is for various reasons. We need to keep the taxonomies science based and the UK through the CCC and its, its decarbonisation pathways has a more, ambition, a more ambitious net zero pathway. Um, I think this is an opportunity for sure. The opportunity here is to drive up international ambition. So if the UK wants to go further on a specific threshold, we can then through the International Platform on Sustainable Finance or through the ISSB, which Julia was talking about, we can look to influence international taxonomies to also increase ambition. This of course raises several challenges. How does a company report in the UK if it's different to the EU or it's different to China? And this is a lot of the work that we're going to be doing over the next 12 months, but it's definitely on our radar and it's going to be central to our work for the next couple of years. Thank you very much, Ryan, and, and thank you for picking up that, <laughs> that extra question as well. Uh, Julia, if I can come to you in, on the, the, the fossil fuels and the deforestation, as we were yeah. talking about earlier, uh, but also I wondered if you had anything to add to, to what Ryan just had to say there, because I think that does chime very much as what you were saying about convergence of international standards. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think um, on, on fossil fuels, I think uh, it's 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 not really a question to us. It's it's you know the International Energy Agency (IPCC). We've seen reports published recently which show that uh, oil is not really compatible with the 1.2 degrees pathway. I think the question we should be asking is, you know, we're not going to to divest from it. This is not the solution, as Ryan said. We we need to engage with those, those companies because a lot of companies that have those um, those financial stakes in um, oil are going to be the ones paying for renewables. So how do we engage with them? How do we convince them to, to, to um, develop alternative uh, plans, which I think a lot of them are already doing, but how, how do we make sure that it effectively works across the system without leading to stranded assets or posing um, additional financial risks by, um, by, by, um, by divesting at scale? Um, I think uh, that the point on deforestation, I think, um, yeah, we, we have it included in the taxonomy. We're going to see some work on this from the TNFD. I think here um, the point on um, interna the international side of things is really important because um, if we end up measuring it differently across different jurisdictions, how do we make sure that um, the impacts that we are trying to make, that different jurisdictions are trying to make, are, um, are viable and, and, and um, comparable. And I can see there's a 
another question in the chat which kind of relates to it is uh, we've seen the ISB's um, establishment at COP26 and uh, you know there's a concern of how the standardization is going to work in practice and whether jurisdictions are going to develop different standards um, at, at um, a different pace. Um, for our members it certainly is a concern um, and, and on our side what we've been doing we've been speaking to um, Treasury Basin and, and flagging that the UK has the power to endorse what the IFRS is doing, what the ISB will be publishing, and, and we should do it because that is going to show best practice internationally. If we support it, maybe others will as well. That, that's what's in our power. The way it's supposed to work at the moment is the ISB is going to have a building blocks approach. So, so the assumption is that we have some kind of a base Hopefully it's not the lowest common denominator, but actually something a bit more ambitious. There's going to be a base and then countries can build on top of it. I think the goal number one is to ensure that this base really is implemented, at least across G7 nations, you know, G20, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, whether you mentioned that, you know, one jurisdiction such as EU may end up with more progressive disclosure uh, disclosures. Um, well, this is already something that they've been uh, flagging for a while that they intend to do. Uh, you know whether it, that's the best approach at the moment. That's a, that's a different question. I think on our side, it, it's key that we ensure and we push for as much convergence as possible. And um, I think if we make sure that this ISV standard is not the lowest common denom denominator, then it's more likely that others won't see it as such and won't build too much on top of it. So um, yeah, I think I think that's that's my answer to that question. Thank you, Julia. And I think I think it sort of reflects uh, some of what both Heather and Ryan were saying there. That's kind of, you know, that now is the time to be setting standards. Let's set those standards high, and then once we've got you know, a, a, a standard and, and we can demonstrate success at delivering against that standard, then that becomes a, uh, you know, a, a model for others to follow. Uh, and that, that, that then it's not just an opportunity, but it's a, it's a, a you know, then becomes, as I say, it make, makes it easier for everybody else to follow. Um, I wanted to just uh, pick up on the question from uh, Chris Dodwell, uh, just going to read it out. Uh, thanks for excellent discussion so far. Uh, that, can, uh, can definitely endorse that. Um, the Committee on Climate Change's sixth carbon budget report has flagged that we need to increase annual investment into the net zero transition from around £6 billion pounds to £50 billion pounds by 2030, which is in eight years and one month. Uh, what role can transition plans play in directing finance into climate solutions? What do the panel consider as the other key elements needed to establish a net zero financial centre or system in the UK? Um, and just I'm going to pick up on this one as well by Tilia Astell. Um, following from the discussion on divestment versus corporate engagement, would the panel be able to outline which are the most important things to be engaging on to deliver climate action? Uh, so that's some, um, I would say probably the two things are quite related there. Heather, I wonder if I can come to you uh, again, because obviously this is very much about uh, the the financial centres and systems that you were talking about in your opening remarks. So Chris's question and then Tilia's, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, I think overall, I mean, I can share a paper actually in the chat afterwards, um, but we wrote a paper on what we think a net zero financial system looks like, so how we green public finance architecture, private financial architecture, so I'll cover the key points. I think the first bit is government actually understanding all the all the tools and pots of money it has at its disposal i don't think it does and these things often happen in silos and are quite piecemeal when they're changed so that would be the first thing i think secondly and very crucially um and this has already been a commitment from government in the greening finance roadmap but a commitment to tracking financial flows both public and private across the economy so we know where the gaps are and I think thirdly, a comprehensive action plan that basically thinks about where the gaps are, thinks about what tools we have at our disposal and, and green some. So a couple of examples include, um, I think, firstly and most importantly, an end to public finance subsidies, both domestically and internationally for oil and gas. I think that's unarguable, frankly. Um, and I think, you know, that, that's, that's one piece I think is really essential. Um, I think also making sure things like the UK Infrastructure Bank are set up to last and actually um, have a net zero screen in their investments and can invest in these new markets that need to scale up technologies is really important. I think that um, making sure that the green taxonomy, once it's developed, 
is used to guide government decision making on its investments across the board. Um, and also, I think um, more importantly, making sure that the government is held accountable to its own um, public finance spending on climate. So that might be establishing a new office, like a net zero and resilience office, in which the government can year on year evaluate you know, its progress in transitioning its public finance towards net zero. On the private finance side, I think we've mentioned a couple of tools. Again, the taxonomy features quite heavily here and using that as part of, uh, using that as the kind of gold standard about what good looks like in terms of net zero investment, what you know, dictionary um, of net zero investment for private companies and integrating that into guidance for transition plans. Um, one bit that I'll pull out, that I think Julia and Ryan both raised um, on this oil and gas question and investment in oil and gas for the private sector is, you know, we do need science-based guidance that does tell people when their investments are net zero aligned and when they aren't. What we also need is we need stewardship guidance that includes advice on how to manage and steward companies that are invested heavily in um, fossil fuels and legacy industries as well. And that's actually not readily available. So I think that would be a really powerful step for a government to issue that guidance. And actually that could form part of the overall package of transition plan guidance that the government is issuing over the next year. So I think that would be a really important step. I mean, there are numerous other pieces that I could bring up. But I think those would be the key ones that I would, would reference. Um, I have forgotten the second question. Um, uh, actually, I'll come back to your, your second point, Chris. Um, and I think you're right. So transition plans, disclosure. I get that the cynics can think that disclosure of a plan is not actually a requirement to act on a plan and what's it going to do. But you'll be surprised how the availability of data and the availability of companies' plans on how they're going to get to net zero will shift capital costs and will start to actively shift investment. The more transparency we have and the more certainty that we have, the more people are going to be able to actively align their business and their investments with net zero. So I think that's, I think actually having the requirement in the first place with solid guidance will start to shift private capital towards green. Um, I will pause there. I'm going to let Ryan and Julia. Uh, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, just before I ask the other two to uh, respond to those points, can I just remind you, if you are enjoying this conversation and you would like to promote it, uh, you can tweet at, at APPG SUSTFIN, so short for Sustainable Finance, obviously, but that's how we've abbreviated it, SUSTFIN. Um, and if you wanted to, to tweet that you are um, part of this conversation, that would be really, really great. Um, Ryan, can I come to you? So um, those further points about divestment and corporate engagement, um, and also I just want to draw attention to the fact that there is another um, question on this from Anna Pick, um, who is saying, uh, presumably the engagement strategy only works if it's backed by the threat of divestment. And what does the panel think is an appropriate ambition level to expect companies to demonstrate before moving on to divestment? and on what timeline. Um, but if you could pick up those previous points as well, that would be great. Yeah, thanks. So on the net zero financial system, um, I was jotting down points and Heather, you've touched on pretty much all of them. So <laughs> sadly, you've covered the, the most of them, but one other easy fix is to stop allowing listings of fossil fuel companies. We still see thousands being listed every couple of years, and that's a semi-easy fix to deny them access to quite a large part of capital. Um, the most important one for me is definitely the tracking of financial flows. Heather's already touched on this, but again, whether the taxonomy can help dictate that by saying, here is the amount that is green every year being invested is a really good way to think about that. But if we can't track it, we can't know when we're reaching those figures that the CCC are telling us to reach because the data, as is often the case when we have this discussion, is the biggest blocker to achieving a lot of the transition. Um, Heather also mentioned having the taxonomy underpinning public finance as well as private finance. Um, just for clarity of everyone, Heather and E3G are uh, central in our work on the taxonomy in ensuring how can the taxonomy support public finance. And one of the big arguments here is why would private finance institutions think they should be using this if it's not being set by the public finance as well? So they're really leading the way. Um, with the green guilt, they have committed to aligning the investments from that to the taxonomy. It would be great in the future to see that apply to the UK Infrastructure Bank and also various other types of public spending. Um, question on divestment versus stewardship. Um, I think education as to the risks is really important here and making sure that they realise that investing in fossil fuels, especially new ones, is actually a bad financial investment. I talked about stranded assets earlier, but that is absolutely central to this. 
Um, the threat of divestment, yes, there is always the threat that can go behind this. But I think having those conversations, have those honest conversations and acting in good faith between the various actors is the more important thing to be doing here. Thank you very much, Ryan. That's really interesting. And Julia, I just wonder if I could get some more uh, comments from the CBI on, on this whole conversation about divestment. Um, yeah, no, of course. I think um, the question on what, what's, um, what's a reasonable uh, plan to, to, to work with companies and how we should divest, I think we speak to a lot of companies and they, they have very different strategies. You know, some of them, some of them uh, threaten with uh, divestment in 2023, some of them in 2025, some, some of them in 2030, if they don't see any progress. So I think, as, as Ryan mentioned, the key is education. I think when, when you work on the policy side of things and, 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 and you know, you, you spend your days reading changes in regulations, it's often hard to, easy to forget that not everyone does. And you would be surprised how often we, we speak to businesses, large businesses that actually struggle to understand, especially if they have to face, you know, US standards that are coming, EU standards. Very often, this is a group of people that have to, um, have to uh, oversee um, all of these changes across different jurisdictions and all of these different opinions on, on how to act best. So I think if you are an investor that really wants to lead to some change, you need to work together with the company that you invest in and, and the stewardship side of things and more stewardship guidance will be absolutely key. I think on the question of what is going to, um, Chris's question on what's going to um, help us establish a net zero financial center, I think again here it's really making sure that the frameworks that we implement are usable, um, not only credible and scientific, that, that's you know, obvious, but they're actually usable. We've seen it already on the, in the EU. The taxonomy is a huge piece of, um, piece of regulation. We're working on it together. We know it very well. Um, 400 pages of, of different regulatory requirements for different sectors. Um, and um, I think what we are facing here is the risk that we develop something so complex that it actually, first of all, doesn't reflect what's happening in the real economy. And secondly, it's too difficult for companies to use. So I think we've seen a lot of ideas from the treasury, you know, on um, how to make it more usable. For example, um, this, we, we will have disclosures against the um, taxonomy showing taxonomy aligned investments in, in CapEx, OpEx and turnover. That's a great way to simplify what the taxonomy actually is for. But we need to think whether, you know, do we need some digital tools to simplify it? Do we need certain proxies? And this is something that, you know, the CBI works with the GFI and uh, the E3G and the GTAC to, to make sure that businesses we identify early on how to how to make the most of that tool and, and other tools that are um, coming our way. Excellent. And um, we've got about five minutes left and I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I'm going to uh, abuse my chair's privilege and ask a quick question of my own, which I think I feel might just be kind of a, a, as a useful sort of wrap up. Um, and I'm just um, uh, Heather was um, bemoaning the acronym of B3W, Build Back Better, but, but from, from where I sit, uh, Build Back Better is an acronym that very much describes post-pandemic as much as post-COP or, or, or anything else. And I just wondered if any of you thought that the experience of the pandemic, how that's going to feed into some of the, uh, some of the changes we need to see in our financial system. Obviously, we've had this kind of big break on economic activity over the last 20 months. And as we're you know, you know, recovering from that. And it's obviously been a global phenomenon uh, in a way that we really haven't seen before. And I just wondered if just as last thoughts, whether you think that's going to play a, a, a role in, in helping perhaps to accelerate the transition. So perhaps I'd come to Ryan first and Heather and then Julia and just quick thoughts on that. I think absolutely. I think um, the pandemic has really realigned what people think about the natural environment and their local area. It switched people on to the precariousness of losing your job and systemic risks. And when we're talking about systemic risks, the biggest looming systemic risk is that of the climate crisis. So I think absolutely it's aligned more people to the fact that we need to have action. It has also introduced an opportunity for finance as well. We've seen a lot more social bonds as they're called. So bonds which are issued with an intention to invest in social outcomes during the pandemic. And that is a trend that's fantastic to see and hopefully will continue to grow over the coming years. I think also we've seen a shift in the public spending attitude and whether that continues with this current government going forward is, is harder to say, but with public spending now, with the need for it to be being made, you can target that into areas which are green, that support the green transition, and then you're supporting, you're, you're killing two birds with one stone. 
we're recovering from COVID, but also targeting that spending to build green jobs and to support the green economy. Things such as zero economic, zero emission vehicles and zero carbon buildings, where a lot of the spending needs to be going. Hopefully that will happen because of the COVID recovery. That's excellent, Ryan. And what about you, Heather? Any thoughts on that? Well, Sarah, this is one of my favourite topics, actually. Um, I think that... Um, I we only have a couple of minutes. <laughs> I know. Um, and I, I think we could get some violent agreement here. Um, so I agree with everything Ryan said. And I would just build on the fact that actually what COVID has really shown is that the public, public finance can be mobilised quickly and rapidly to tackle crises. And so I think that when the government... Um, spent 37 billion on a tra test, uh, track and trace app through uh, poorly managed um, uh, thinking and planning. I think they can definitely mobilise more than the feeble amount we received in the spending review this year. And I think that that's, that's really critical um, for us to do, firstly, to remember that we can invest in this stuff. And I think the second point that I'd just bring out is that, I'd, quite as Ryan said, this is an investment in our future. By investing in net zero, it's not just a cost, it's we're actually mitigating the risk of unchecked climate change, which is going to be devastating for countries and communities around the world. But also, we're going to unlock new business opportunities, new job creation, new industries that allow us to have a better world and a better way of living. And I think that that's a narrative we really have to get through is that net zero is an investment. And I'll just, I'll lend an anecdote um, that I think really sums it up. I had a very vigorous conversation with a taxi driver, a very anti-net zero on my way to cop the cop venue called Jimmy. And um, he pushed me back on every single piece. He's like, net zero is useless, it's all lies, so and so forth. And then told me this anecdote that I think sums it up. Uh, when the when LEDs came online and there was a requirement to change over those light bulbs, he went out and begrudgingly invested 150 quid to get bulbs for his whole house. He spent the day plugging them in, took the day off work just to do it all. So that's probably like 400 quid of his time to do that. He then told me that doing so paid back his investment in two months in his energy bills and his lower costs. And so after that, we managed to have a really robust discussion about net zero in the same vein, that net zero is an investment and we will we'll get return in the long term. So I'll end on that. I am I'm extremely impressed that you managed to talk around a Glasgow taxi driver. I mean, that, <laughs> that, that, that that's, that's impressive. Um, Julia, then, just a, to the last... Uh, yeah last word from you well i think i think the pandemic has completely changed the way we think about esg when you think about for example bond issuance green bonds were on the rise before the pandemic the pandemic happened and suddenly we've seen the spike of social bonds i think we started asking ourselves questions you know there are risks that we haven't accounted for obviously climate change being the biggest systemic risk but for example if you think about pandemics the risk increases if you have a loss of biodiversity. So should we, is biodiversity something that we should be looking into? And one of the reasons um, the CBI has included the sustainable community section in our paper is because we have businesses out now coming to us and, and you know seeing that there are other ESG issues that they should be looking at beyond climate. And I think this leads to a, you know, obviously we've been, businesses have already been um, discussing their uh, social responsibility for a while, but I think the pandemic has really been a turning point where um, Friedman's doctrine of the, the, the you know the, the the reason why business exists is to um, the, its social responsibility is to increase its profits. I think now businesses realize that it's not as simple as that. And if we, for example, have you know don't take care of biodiversity early enough, or don't take care of good infrastructure, or don't take care of our healthcare system, we might face risks that we haven't even thought of um, at the moment. Um, so yeah, we're very excited to continue looking at, at the broad spectrum of ESG with, with everyone else and uh, hopefully we'll manage to deal with those risks before they become as, as difficult as, as climate change. Excellent, which brings us very, very tidily to the end of our time. Um, so I just firstly want to thank uh, all three of my panellists for a, such an interesting discussion and for some real expertise and some, you know, really fantastic um, uh discussion there. So uh, firstly, Ryan Jude, Heather McKay and Julia Jasinska, thank you all so much. Thank you also to Joe and to Zoe from UK 100 for organising today's event. And thank you very much to everybody who has attended for some really, really interesting questions. And thanks very much. Thank you.